Hi, I'm HexDSL, and in the last 12 months, I've produced a YouTube video every single day about Linux and Linux gaming. There have been some really great games this year, and if you're going to commit to making a YouTube video every single day, you couldn't ask for a better year than 2017. There have been some really great releases, some surprise releases. There have been some games I never thought we'd get on Linux, and there have been some complete turkeys that I'll probably never forget. This has been a year when I've played more individual different games than I ever thought I would. Pretty much every day I've been firing up something new and giving it a go. Which is funny, because we're on a platform where people say there are no games to play. I think I've successfully proven that wrong this year. We're at the end of the year, it's the new year on the horizon, and traditionally YouTubers create top 10 videos or countdown videos. I'm going to sort of spend some time now talking about games, and they're things that I think should be talked about this year. All of the games I'm going to talk about was released in 2017 for Linux. They may have come to other platforms earlier, but they have come to Linux in 2017. Now this list is also only of games I have personally played. So if there's something committed from the list that you feel is a massive oversight, there's a good chance it's simply not on the list because I didn't play it. And had I played it, I would have thought, my gosh, this is wonderful, it would have been straight on the list. There's also a few games I've added to the list that I feel needed to be here for whatever reason. But I'm going to explain my reasons as we go. This is going to be a long video. Whether you agree with this or not is really your own decision and I'd very much appreciate your feedback in the comments below. However, hopefully you'll find this entertaining, and maybe insightful, but at the very least interesting. West of Loathing by Asymmetric was released on the 10th of August 2017 and gets overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam. This game is visually striking. It's an almost hand-drawn black and white stick figure adventure set in the Wild West. It's a comedy game where the comedy is somewhere between Monty Python and South Park. Most of the laugh out loud moments come from the dialogue between characters where they have oddly casual and sincere conversations while being completely absurd. One of the plots this took me on early on was retrieving horses from all over the local area. A lot of these horses was strange in unique ways, one of which was actually a ghost. The game is very self-referential and does a good job of making fun of the genre it actually is, while still somehow maintaining the ability to be a competent game. It's interesting and entertaining, and I guarantee you've not played anything quite like West of Loathing. The Dishwasher Vampire Smile was first released in 2011 for the Xbox Live Arcade, but came to Linux in May of 2017. It's by Scar Studios, a studio that made Salt and Sanctuary and Charlie Murder. These games are dark and grimy and hand-drawn, and very, very sinister at their core. Dishwasher Vampire Smile is no exception to that, and it's difficult for me to talk about it without getting overly verbose, because the thing I like about the dishwasher is how when Scar Studios crafted it, they was absolutely unafraid to be hyper, ultra violent. And I don't usually like these sorts of games. I don't I don't really like side scrolling beat ups. I don't usually like hyper violent games. But in the case of Dishwasher Vampire Smile, every time you attack an enemy it feels almost personal. It is an absolute pleasure to play while being incredibly dark and sinister and most certainly not for kids. The art style complements the gameplay style in a way that, I, as far as I know, only Scar can assemble. And it is, of all the side-scrolling beat-em-ups I've ever played, one of the ones that feels the most unique in its structure. Also, there's a rhythm game in the game as well, which the first time you see it is massively jarring but you soon get into it. The game is enjoyable. It's massively enjoyable, in fact, and I would wholeheartedly recommend anyone to go look at it. And if you are looking at this and you're being put off by the weird, sketchy art style, um, you should watch some of the videos of it in motion because this game really does come alive in motion, whereas in screenshots, it looks odd. It looks a very odd game in screenshots, but the motion is really what gives it its depth. 
It's not a game I usually play, as I've said, but I certainly did enjoy my time with the dishwasher, A Vampire Smile. The Away Team, developed by Underflow Studios, gets mixed reviews on Steam, which to me is quite shocking. The game was released on the 22nd of July 2016, but found its way to Linux on the 23rd of March 2017. The first time I played this game, I knew literally nothing about it. A few people had requested it on stream and I was stuck for something to play, so I loaded in. All I knew was there was a fair bit of text and it was science fiction. I didn't realise how much text, and partly that's the reason it's on this list, because this game is a hyper-text adventure. It is a sci-fi epic told to you in paragraph and paragraph of text. You simply make decisions and pick crew members to go on a mission, but vast chunks of the game are out of your hands. You could think of it as a visual novel without the visual element. At any given time, about 80% of the screen is pure text. You could probably play this on a terminal without any real stretch of the imagination. That's the thing that this game does. It is a stretch of the imagination. It has a wonderful way of telling you a story in almost bite-sized chunks, paragraph by paragraph, and then letting you make decisions. The more you play the game, the more informed your decisions may or may not be, depending if you've seen the scenario before. The reason it's here, the reason that I chose this as a game with a unique experience, is uh, surprising, because text adventures have been around in the form of books longer than I've actually been alive. In a world of visual novels, it's rare to see a game so confidently texty. A game that fills the screen with green text and doesn't try and shy away from it. It shows you everything it is right from the first page you see. And from there you get more of what's expected. A wonderfully written sci-fi epic that puts your crew's lives at stake and really, really sucks you into the story. It's not for everyone, which is why it gets mixed reviews on Steam. I would think a lot of people would have been quite surprised with how few graphical elements it has. But if you're someone who can get past that, who can just enjoy the game for what it is, the presentation and the story this has on offer is a game that I literally haven't seen before. I mean, I there's been text adventures, sure, but nothing so modern that has such a clear goal. I admire that in a game, and I think that a lot of people would really enjoy the away team. Typo Man by Brainseed Factory was released on the 15th of August 2016 and made its way to Linux in February of 2017. This is an interesting game because when I first heard the name Typo Man and I saw the odd screenshot, I expected this to be a test of spelling. I expected it to be one of those typing games or a game that involved an awful lot of word searching and word hunting. And when I logged into the game, when I loaded it up for the first time, I was surprised because this game is a pure platformer. It's a literal platform game. But some of the mechanics, uh, some of the things you have to puzzle out uh, to progress, some of the objects you have to move, are letters. They're rarely hidden in a way that taxes you as a writer, but more a case of taking a circle, taking an old tire you see in the junkyard, and rolling it over to a lift to turn the N in the lift into the word on, or to take some letters to, that you find lying around the world to make the word rain, to fill up a pond. These are all mechanics you face in this game. It's never a forced trial of spelling. It is only ever a puzzle mechanic of finding the right thing, or seeing a letter where you may see a junk pile and pulling them out. It's fascinating. There are letters everywhere in this game while it's not about spelling or reading. And that's the thing that really strikes me about it. The main character is made of letters. Some of the enemies are made of the word fear. And I was playing probably halfway through the game before I realised I was made of words because it's so stylized and it's just a part of this world you're in. And even after finishing it, I'm not quite sure who Typo Man is or what this world's all about. But it didn't matter. I had a nice time playing it and I felt like I had an experience I'd not quite had before. The game is quite short and I feel like it does everything it wants to do in that time and wouldn't really benefit from being much longer. And it certainly offers a platform experience with just enough of a twist to really set it apart from other things. It was something I really enjoyed playing. Day of Infamy by New World Interactive was released on 23rd of March 2017 
the game is a World War II shooter, and it is by the people that bought you the now well-known Insurgency. Dave Infamy is not the best looking game I've ever played. In fact, I find the graphics to be serviceable at best. The thing about Dave Infamy that really sucks me in is the feeling that you're truly at war. As you go into it, the immersion doesn't come from the graphics directly, but as the frantic feeling that any minute you're going to get shot. Every weapon feels underpowered. Every class feels slightly out of place. And as you learn the game and as you progress through the game and you start learning how to fire and when to reload, the more technical side of it is where the reward comes from. It's a game I've enjoyed quite a bit of this year and I wish more of my regular group of people I play with played this with me because Day of Infamy is a game that I think there's a lot of joy to be had in. But there's also a lot of frustration and endless respawning because it is so difficult. It is by far of all the shooters I've played that came out in 2017, the one that I really find to be a different experience to the rest. It's not just running around shooting things. This is a methodical game. And working as a team and clearing those areas and slowly getting to the final objective does feel rewarding. Even if you're doing badly, you're just at the back trying not to get shot, you still feel like you're part of the overall fight. And there's something really enjoyable about that. It's no mistake that it reminds me of Day of Defeat to play, and it's most certainly uh, designed to be a successor to that game in vibe and in feeling and in play style, while very much being its own thing. Day of Infamy is a game I enjoyed quite a lot this year. Civilization VI was developed by 2K and ported by Aspire. It originally was released the 20th of October 2016, and the Linux port arrived on February of 2017. Civilization VI did a lot to streamline and boil a lot of mechanics down to their core. It was accused of being an oversimplification, but for me, Civilization VI is an accessible reworking of Civilization. It allows people who have never played a Civilization game to come on board without being scared off by the sheer number of mechanics at play. It is a very interesting game that I enjoyed quite a lot. The multiplayer, however, is quite interesting because it is, of course, the same multiplayer or thereabouts that you've got in all Civilization games. But this is the newest one. It came out this year, and I think a lot of people would have jumped on board the series with this title because it is a little bit more cartoony, a little bit more approachable. And I can see many people and getting their friends to play Civilization for the first time and playing co-op to go through it holding their hand or to ruthlessly destroy them with, with weapons of, of destruction. Because that's how Civilization is. You never really know it's going to go. And if you fully intend to cooperate with a friend, you could find that your opposite ends of the map and they lie with someone you're at war with. And before you know it, that plan to go co-op can be out the window. However, do remember that Civilization is a long-form game, and it's not something you'll be knocking out in, in 20 minutes. It's something you'll be playing for your entire evening, maybe multiple evenings. As Civilization VI is quite the investment, but it's most certainly worth it, because all the joy you can have single-player can also be had multiplayer. And in my experience, it works pretty flawlessly, at least from Linux to Linux. And... I've enjoyed many a game of it. An experience that's unique to itself, even though Civilization VI's multiplayer doesn't stand out in Civilization terms, compared to every other game, the Civilization is very much its own beast. And it's a game that I think a lot of people would have enjoyed this year. I certainly have. Civilization VI is a wonderful multiplayer experience. Tooth and Tail was released by Pocket Watch Games on the 12th of September 2017. It is an interesting RTS that uses a command unit instead of a traditional cursor to give orders to troops, meaning that unlike traditional RTSs that have multi-directional things going on all sorts of ends of the map, these are smaller maps with more localised battles because the command unit is needed to issue commands. 
It's a game that uses procedurally generated maps as well, whereas most RTSs have meticulously designed maps so that neither side has a particular advantage over the other. While I'm sure the procedural engine takes this into account, you can have massively different experiences from game to game with this, and that again adds a new layer. The fact that using the command unit instead of a cursor to issue commands to your troops means that seasoned RTS players have to relearn their strategies, while new players have less of an area to keep track of, meaning this can be something you can really play together with with people, regardless of their skill levels in the genre. Tooth and Tail is an interesting game, and it's visually quite good as well. Um, it has a, a sort of mid-tier pixel artwork that I really like with these overlaid hand-drawn pieces of artwork which although don't fit the aesthetic as a whole are all very nice pieces on their own. There's a lot of joy to be had in Tooth and & Tail and I think most people who are inclined to play RTSs will really like how it's made things slightly different while still being a very serious RTS game. Owlboy by D-Pad Studio was released on the 1st of November 2016 but took until January of 2017 to make it to Linux. And I'm quite pleased that that was the case because it means yet again I get to talk about Owlboy. Now, as people know on this channel, I'm quite the fan of pixel art. And Owlboy has the best pixel art. And that's not, that's not an overstatement. Owlboy is the absolute best pixel art I've ever seen. There is not a single scene, a single frame of Owlboy that is not purely stunning. The game has been lovingly drawn. It's probably drawn, redrawn, iterated, edited over and over and over because it was in development for the better part of 10 years. And it is a game that really, really shows that love. And it shows it in pixels that are so intentional. Every single pixel appears to be there 100% on purpose. And the greater image that they all build is beautiful. Now, the gameplay itself is also rather good. It's not just the artwork this game relies on. The gameplay, your character gets to fly around the screen freely for pretty much the entirety of the game, choosing which one of his allies and friends to take with him to carry, because each one of them has different skills. And those skills are used to traverse through this world to get to the next portion of the game, because you are trying to save your people. And the only way to do that is to puzzle your way through the beautiful pixel art and make it into the clouds to accomplish some tasks, which I won't spoil here. There's nothing really about Owlboy I would change. It's a game that is very, very, very good. And my only real criticism is that it ended. I could quite easily have kept playing this forever because it was so beautiful. And maybe other people won't feel quite as strongly in favor of it as I do because, as I've said so many times, I'm a fan of pixel art. And with this being the best pixel art, it's a game that I was already always going to love. But when the gameplay turned out to be so good, I was, I was thrilled. Owlboy, in my opinion, is one of the best games that I played in 2017. Space Torrent by Blue Wizard Digital was released in July of 2017. The game takes the grand ideas put forward by Stellaris and Master of Orion and other such games. It boils it down to its absolute essence. It then puts a friendly cartoon coat of paint on it and packages it like it's an arcade game. The end result is a much more accessible experience that people can enjoy with very little barrier of entry. The commitment to the animal aesthetic as well as the rapid gameplay makes the game something that I keep going back to. Dolores will take me so long to get through a single campaign and Master of Orion starts to fatigue me after a while. Space Tyrant is always there, being so fast and so readily available. When I first played it on stream, a few people said that they felt it was a mobile experience. I don't think that's entirely true. I think Space Tyrant has lots of systems that interact with each other in very interesting ways, but their dedication to making sure you can understand everything that's happening by simply glancing at the screen means that the UI is a lot less cluttered, giving you that instantly accessible vibe. Space Tyrant even puts forward interesting combat mechanics and this strange card-based system that I've not seen implemented in quite this way in other games. It makes for an all-round satisfying experience that I've gone back to time and time again. Hand of Fate 2 by Defiant Development was released on November of 2017, making it a latecomer to this list. 
It's worth saying I didn't even like Hand of Fate 1, and here I am talking about Hand of Fate 2 as one of the games I've enjoyed the most in 2017. The game puts you against a dealer who's playing a card game with you. He somehow seems friendly, while at the same time being your enemy, or at least appearing to be your enemy. As you play his card game by his rules, you travel from place to place, each place represented by a card. Sometimes that results in combat, and when that happens you're dropped into a third person brawler. The combat on the third person brawler is just tight enough to be skill based, while at the same time not being particularly difficult to master. All the items that you have in your brawler sections are defined by the decisions you make in the card game portion. What this game does, which the first one didn't, is mash two separate genres and put them together in a way that feels like one cohesive experience. I don't feel like I'm being dropped out of an RNG card game into a skill-based brawler. I feel the one complements the other and almost creates the other. And then there's the individual scenarios that some cards have on them where you get a small portion of the story to build upon the lore of the world. Whether or not these things are happening in the real world or are simply a part of a card game, you have no way of telling within the context of the game, which just adds to the mystery. Each individual quest is put together like an individual chapter of a book or episode of a television show and is self-contained for all intents and purpose. I find the bite-sized nature of these chunks to be something that pulls me back in. I almost constantly want to go, okay, one more mission. The fact that you can always tackle more than one of these quests as well means that if something's not to your taste or something's particularly difficult for you, you can go to a different one and try and pick up some new skills, new items there and come back and tackle it when you're more ready. Everything about this game is well polished. From the artwork on the cards to the environment you're sitting with the dealer with so many strange trinkets around. And then the combat sequences are put together in quite in depth way. Instead of being rooms and dungeons, these are open world areas where you can see across the exits of the road and you can see people coming from a distance while still feeling like a small confined arena. It's something I've enjoyed and I can't wait to actually get to the end of this mighty fine campaign. Everspace by Rockfish Games was released on the 25th of May 2017. Then the developer made some on again off again updates, at one point implying it probably wasn't going to arrive for Linux. And then eventually, in September, the game quietly launched. It nearly never made it to this list because of a technicality. You see, according to the Steam page, there is no Linux version for this game. There is no Linux or SteamOS logo where it says add to cart. And if you scroll down on the page, you'll find no requirements for Linux or Steam. It's essentially still in beta. In the end though, I had to put it on this list because it's a game that I'd been looking forward to for so long. And then when it eventually launched, I loaded it up gleefully and I was not disappointed. Everspace is a spaceship flying game that is a roguelike in nature. You go from area to area, getting what resources you can, defeating the enemies that are in the area, and then basically giving yourself the best chance to finish the next area. You use the jump option to jump into the next area, where you repeat the loop until eventually you are destroyed. You probably will be destroyed, because the game is quite difficult. When you're destroyed, you get the chance to spend all the credits you earned in that run, and then any remainder credits are then binned and you start a new run. So if there's something particularly expensive you want, you can't save for it. You have to simply get the money you need in one run, giving you impetus to search each area and find every last piece of loot before moving on to the next area, which is no doubt more difficult and will probably cost you resources to get through alive. The game is daunting when you first load it up. The sense of isolation you have is really striking because in this game everything you face is either dead set against you and wants you dead or totally indifferent. There are no allies to come across or friends to meet in this game. It is you versus the universe and I find that really rewarding. The fact that all of the combat in this game is skill based there's no real RNG to stop you apart from what you're going to find in the area. But how far you progress, for the most part, is based on how well you fly your ship, which upgrades you chose, and the direction on the map you decided to jump in. I find the game rewarding to play. I find it beautiful visually. I like the way I can flip from cockpit view to third person view, depending on what I'm doing. And I like the fact that the enemies that jump in 
and get harder and harder until eventually I'm fighting an entire fleet. The game is a wonderful experience, which I have very little bad to say. I would have liked to have seen it be co-op, because I think doing the same game loop with your friends could have been really enjoyable, but I think that we've taken away from the feeling of isolation the game has on offer. The game is such a beautiful roguelike experience that I couldn't leave it off this list. XCOM 2 War of the Chosen was released on the 29th of August 2017. The Linux version came a few days later on the 31st of August. It was developed by Fraxis and the port was created by Feral Interactive. This game is an expansion for XCOM 2 and I was hesitant to put it on this list because it is DLC for a game that came out before 2017. However, there's so much in War of the Chosen that I feel like it could quite easily have been a standalone product. This is the game that got me playing XCOM. This is the game that made me rekindle the love from XCOM I had from the 90s because the rebooted franchise hadn't really sat with me. It hadn't really sucked me in. And then I played War of the Chosen and I loved everything from the over-the-top voice acting to the ridiculous motivational posters you can make. I spent more time customising soldiers than I did playing some evenings. The game is a really, really interesting experience, and the additional portions of the plot that are added by War of the Chosen mean that there's not only a lot to do in this game, but there is too much to do. You cannot hit everything you want to do in a single playthrough. That's a wonderful feeling. To know that you're not supposed to do everything in a game is a little bit unusual. Usually you're a completionist that gets to absolutely everything, but this encourages you to just go for the main plot, or just go for that one side mission. And because of that, I found it really engaging. War of the Chosen still has all the same XCOM 2 stuff, like those percentages that are seemingly magical and odd, when you miss that shot when you've got your barrel of your gun pressed into an alien's face. But these are representations of a battlefield, not to be taken quite so literally as people expect. And War of the Chosen is a game that I've really, really enjoyed. It is the reason that I now consider myself to be an XCOM player. And I think that alone is reason enough to put it on the list, at least for me. And I wonder how many more people have ignored XCOM because it wasn't quite for them, whereas War of the Chosen's science fiction plot and heavy voice acting could be the thing to suck you in. War of the Chosen is a game I found myself going back to time and time again. It's a game I've enjoyed streaming and playing outside of stream. I even played it for nine hours straight one day because I needed to research. The fact is, War of the Chosen is a compelling experience that I'm glad to have had this year. Dungeons 3, developed by Realm Voice Studios, released on the 13th of October this year, is a game that's a little bit special to me. Because up until Dungeons 3, I did not like the dungeon management genre. In fact, I even made a YouTube video talking about how I was surprised that I didn't like the genre at all. I played Dungeons 2 and bounced off it fairly quickly. I played War of the Overworld and I couldn't wait to exit. And then when Dungeon 3 came along, I thought I'd just give it one last try. And I'm really glad I did because I fell in love with Dungeon 3. It snuck up on me quite quickly. Something about the lead character, Talia, the, uh, the first general character you get, is interesting. Her voice acting is a bit silly and a bit tongue-in-cheek. And the fact she has conversations with the other personality in her head and interacts with the narrator directly is just daft enough to make me think, hey, I, I want to see more of this. And then the dungeon itself, it's satisfying and simple to work through and to build up your dungeon. I try and make each individual dungeon perfect before I move on. I try and max out my horde and then just steamroll the enemies. One day I tried to get the most gobblers I possibly could into a dungeon for feeding my troops. It's silly and it lets you play however you want. But also as you go through, there's quite a deep strategy game there as well. But all of it is done in the confines of this odd and tongue-in-cheek world. Dungeons is a game where I'm almost a little bit sad when I progress from a mission because I have to leave the dungeon I've worked so hard to make perfect. It's a game that has built a love of a genre I just didn't like. And that's quite a trick because it rarely happens. In fact, the only other game that's happened with has been XCOM War of the Chosen, which is also on this list. Looking forward to finishing, but I'll be somewhat sad when I do get to the end because it means it'll be over. And I'm fairly sure I'll probably play again from the start, trying to nail every mission as perfectly as I can, because that's the kind of game that Dungeons 3 is. Pyre by Supergiant Games is a very well-realised game. 
It was released the 25th of July 2017 and is part visual novel with minor roleplay elements and part fantasy basketball game. The game takes place in a world where all of the people you encounter have been exiled and in order to be unexiled and return home they must compete in the right which is the fantasy basketball game. Because the writing is so strong and there's so much time spent with the dialogue and the characters, when you get to play your basketball game, you're fighting for more than a win or a rank or a point. You're fighting for the freedom of people that you've come to know through dialogue. You really want to help set them free and return them to their lives. So when you lose, it's sort of heartbreaking because it's not just a point you've lost or a retry screen but you have to deal with the fallout of that loss and work your way through the game in order to progress and take back that loss the game is interesting visually as well the world it's got looks like a 70s rock album cover that you travel through and it never fails to give you a surprise as you're going the characters as i said are fascinating but their visual style is also distinct with each one being visually different that doesn't just work in the dialogue portions of the game they play differently in the right as well the larger characters moving slower and being more defensive and the short faster characters being able to zip around the game much more it means that even down to picking your team to picking which characters play and don't play can be integral to the plot and can be integral to winning or losing in this world Pi is a game that I have yet to finish because I'm trying to find time to play this uninterrupted because I feel like it deserves my utmost attention. Pi is a wonderful experience and it's most certainly worth you playing. It's an experience I didn't expect to have in 2017 and I was quite surprised when I played it and it was so different from Bastion and Transistor. But I must say, if this is the direction Supergiant are moving in, I most certainly approve. Now I wanted to give you a quick rundown of honourable mentions. Games that was not released in 2017, but I've played an awful lot of and had a great time. Those are, very quickly, Rento Fortune, the Monopoly inspired board game that lacks polish and lacks any Linux updates for quite some time, but still a game I've played absolutely stacks of this year. The next one is Chaos Reborn, a game I've played absolutely loads of multiplayer it never fails to deliver a great gameplay experience it looks nice it's got lots of hidden depth and i play it with a bunch of friends and we always always have a great time with it the next is borderlands 2 a game i found myself getting really really into this year and i've made videos about it already i've played loads of it the only reason it's not by far my game of the year is because it's a good few years old now but this is the year where I've played a bit of Borderlands to say the least. My final pick for this list of honourable mentions is a game that was released this year, but unfortunately is a Windows game. That's Domina. Domina is a game I've played in Wine. I've streamed it and I've had friends on the stream commenting and heckling as I've played the game. It is a single player experience that I've managed to make a multiplayer experience by sharing it with people on stream. Domina is a game that you simulate a Roman Colosseum. The experience of fighting your gladiators. It's a great game that I hope does one day come to Linux. But for now I have to admit it off the list. Perhaps it will come to Linux and make it for next year's list. This is the moment in the video where I told myself I was going to announce a winner. I was going to say this is the game that won 2017. And I am absolutely going to do that shortly. But I think first it's important to say I came to this list. I came up with this list with careful consideration and there are things on the list that I didn't expect to be there myself and there's a lot less indie titles, there's a lot less smaller titles than I expected um, but there are so many other games that could have been here. Of the ones I chose, absolutely any one of them could have been the game that I crowned winner, Hex's winner of 2017. And by announcing this winner it by no means invalidates any of the other games the decision in the end when it comes down to it is essentially arbitrary because they're all amazing games but there's one game that stood out the most it was almost owlboy because i keep thinking about owlboy's artwork and i think in a hundred years time if you play that game you'll still be amazed with how it looks 
But once I'd finished Owlboy, I wanted to see the art again, but I didn't want to play the game again. Not that it's bad, it was a great game, obviously, it's was on the list. But um, it didn't make me keep wanting to go back, and I feel the game that I say was the best of 2017 should be a game that I don't get bored of. A game that I don't just finish and put down, but a game I want to keep going back to, because that's where the value is in these games. Because after all, what's a game if you don't desperately want to play it, you know? It should be something you really want to keep playing. So, in the end, careful, careful consideration. And I have been working on this video for quite some time, and I've really given it some thought. The game that, for me, has won 2017. And to be specific, this is a Linux game released in 2017. It was... XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. It's a game that's given me so many reasons to recount stories. The voice acting has been so fun, and the experience has been so enjoyable. I feel like I've only scratched the surface of it, yet I'm still at the point where I just want to be better. I desperately want to be better at the game, but I don't think anyone's really good at XCOM 2. I think that's kind of the point. And a lot of people might be annoyed that I've chosen a game that is an expansion, a DLC for a game released before 2017. And if you feel like that, just pretend I said any one of the other games because they're all fantastic. And this is, as I said, a completely arbitrary decision. But XCOM 2, War of the Chosen, I just edged it out because I just want to be better. As a game, it succeeded the most in making me want to challenge myself to play and see and do more, more efficiently in the game. And that, to me, is the sign of a good game. A need to play, a desire to play endlessly is what separates an average game from a truly amazing game. And XCOM 2 was that for me this year. War of the Chosen elevated a game I wasn't interested in into something I consider to be an absolute gem of the genre, and it's made me like a genre I didn't really care for before. It could have been anyone, but it was XCOM 2, War of the Chosen. Thank you all for watching this far in the video. Feel free to debate my final decisions and game picks in the comments below. Don't forget to share this video, that'd really help me out, and maybe spread the love for Linux and show people all the great games we've got. Thank you very much to all the people that have followed my videos for the last 12 months and will do hopefully in the future. Thank you to all the people who support me on Patreon because genuinely, honestly, it is wonderful that you do that and I appreciate all of you do for me. And I know I don't say it enough and I always apologise for not saying it enough, but wow, you guys are great. You guys really do support me and help me out. And thank you very, very much. I've been HexDSL. Thank you very much for your time. And goodbye.